Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Pulse Check Podcast. I'm Hee Hee. And I'm Mandy. And today we are diving into a very interesting topic. Mandy just got back from speaking at a national conference designed for nurses. Yay, Mandy. We're so yeah, proud yeah. of you. I kept up with all of your funsies on your Instagram stories and so many people were tagging you. People were saying how great your, your session was and you looked like you were having a ton of fun. However, when you got back here and you and I started to debrief, bummer it kind of it fucked you up real good is what you said those were the words you used you were like man it fucked me up but in a good way and there were just so many parallels between bedside nursing and nursing within the hospital system that were mirrored I mean they were just so similar once you got to working with this national organization to be a speaker some of the things that popped out to me was really a lack of communication. We see that bedside and you experienced it being a speaker. Unpaid labor. I mean, that is like the whole MO of the hospital system, getting nurses to work for free and we're doing all of this unpaid labor. And that was similar in your speaking engagement as well. And then finally, just the smoke and mirrors of it all. Things feel oftentimes very performative in the hospital system, especially from nurses. You know, it kind of comes down to past episodes that we've done of like, why did you give me a rock with squiggly eyes when you literally could have given us all a $50 gift card and told us to do something nice for our ourselves that smoke and mirrors idea or yeah, and, performative. right was part of this too so let's dive into it I think a lot of nurses right now are in this pivotal place where they're trying to leave bedside maybe not all the way but at least halfway and they're trying to find other streams of income they're trying to find other things that fulfill them and help them you know still use their nursing degree and reach people in a way that makes them feel happy mm -hmm. how do we do that when everything in the nursing world seems really permeated with these ideas of you no know, communication unpaid labor smoke and mirrors performative performances how did it fuck you up real good <laughs> that sounds so silly now yeah it was it, well I knew it would and you and I talked about it a little bit I didn't want to do this I mean I chose to do it and I'm happy I did and it was an honor to be you know get accepted you know you have to apply to be a speaker or be a presenter at a conference. And even if you're asked to by someone or like referred to as a speaker, you still have to send in your outlines. You have to send in a bunch of information. And so that was cool. It was very validating to be like, oh yeah, my shit is good. And it, it is aligned with nurses and it is at a national level and it is important and it is what people want to hear. That was really validating. But I had said no to speaking at this conference for years. Other friends had asked, let's do it together. Other friends had gone and done it and said, I'll be there speaking. Why don't you do it? I'll help you with the process. And I said, hell no, am I going to pay to play? Because I had just been doing that at the bedside. I had just been giving and giving and giving and giving and not getting paid a fair wage and not getting treated fairly, not having any sick days. Sick days, holidays were the same thing. That's fucked up. That's not okay. That's unethical. It's unethical to not be able to nurse your baby and provide milk for your baby while you're growing your family as a nurse and then teaching other people how to do it and uh, just so many things. I was, I am still recovering from that. And I said, no, I'm not going to pay to go. And you asked me that this morning, right? When we got on and I was like, hey, push record because also like maybe I want to cut it because I'm not proud of the fact that I, I went and paid for my hotel room. It was reduced, but I had to pay to get in. What? I know. I didn't want to tell you. Man. I know. And it's not, I, I feel good that you feel bad. <laughs> That's not really what I mean. But you're shocked because maybe you don't see me as someone who would even do that, right? I don't, I don't think that that's okay. You know, I have created a trauma-informed business model wow. in the years that I've left the bedside and developed an educational business from scratch. And I, I get excited when money moves through my business to other educators and parent educators and my team of women and gender expansive folks. I'm excited to 
grow in that way and to move money through and to be a conduit for good and change. And it is not on brand to be like, please, can I speak for you for free? And also here's a partial ticket fee to get in and like go to all of the other presentations, which you don't really do as a presenter. Right. Yeah. You're not really, you're, I felt like I could be one or the other. I could be Mm -hmm. an attendee or I could be a presenter, but it was really hard to switch my brain into learning and like being, I had two presentations at the conference and it was hard to switch in between. So I, I would love to hear from listeners on Instagram, if you are presenting or want to incorporate that into your nursing resume, (laughs) you're like, away from the hospital gig or grow your away from the hospital gig. I want to hear about it and like where you're going and how does it feel to be, to be asked to provide your own way there. When I bill for educational services, I include travel as do, right? All physicians, all lawyers, all consultants, all coaches, they all do that. And it was a huge discussion within my team, the trauma-informed birth nurse team of, of like, this is how nurses are treated inside the hospital and outside the hospital. This is how people think it's okay to treat nurses. I said, nowhere else do I do this. Nowhere else would I think it's okay. And nowhere else would I expect anyone to come to me for something like this and like pay their way or they wouldn't put that in the fees. And we had to really like wrap our heads around that and process Mm -hmm. through that because we also sell content to nurses. We also sell educational packages to nurses. We also sell whole unit packages of education to hospital systems and like quality collaborations within states like health departments. And they also have a hard time wrapping their head around fair compensation for nurse education. They want to send like a couple nurses to do it and then bring back the education for everyone else, which puts those nurses who are getting educated, which this happens at conferences also. I would meet nurses and they would be like, oh, they sent two of us. So those two now have a responsibility, not just of learning this information for themselves, but being able to learn it so well that in a few days they can regurgitate some of it to their colleagues in like a, in like a professional way in like a we're going to have a staff meeting and you're going to present this. Like, how is that learning? That's not learning. That's like an orientation where you're like getting oriented and then you learn how to do it and then you do it. And then you try to teach like pseudo teach your preceptor. This is how I would do it so that you can really begin to work through those like higher level learning of the process yourself as a learner. But that's not you don't like learn it and then like take a student and then could fully be able to articulate everything. Like you just don't have it integrated yet. (sighs) Messy. It's messy. It's just so indicative of how they view healthcare. I mean, just hearing you say, you know, that they want to use a fraction of their budget reminds me of one time I was approached by the state of Massachusetts and they wanted to do this pilot program at one of our local hospitals and local being the the hospital was about an hour away from our entire team. And I had sat down with them to create a budget. So I knew what budget they were working with. Mm -hmm. And I had drastically reduced our team's price in order to be able to maximize the number of patients that we were going to be able to utilize and serve through this program based on the budget that they had. And I ended up turning in a proposal for right at $800 per patient. And I was estimating that our team would spend about 30 hours per patient for $800. So that breaks down to an hourly rate of about $26. Do you know that they came back to me and said, we need you to work for about $300 per patient, bringing our hourly rate down to $10 an hour. And unfortunately that program wasn't able to get kicked off or at least not with our team, because there's just no sustainable way that our team could work for $10 an hour for all of these 
people, even if it was a pilot program, even if it was, you know, in hopes that more money would come down the pipeline, even if it was serving an underserved population, it doesn't do any good for me to Mm -mm. urban underpopulated population at the expense of my team because then we serve nobody and it just reminds me of this is what do you think this organization's budget was for this conference astronomical it was huge they probably have a ton of money to spend and they wouldn't even help their people who were speaking putting this conference on get out there mm -hmm. they wouldn't help them house themselves that is crazy to me and it's just so indicative of how low on the totem pole valuing health care in our country really is what's the word that is in atlas of the heart that is not guilt and it's not shame but it's like being wronged by somebody else mm -hmm. that's how i feel transgressions i don't think that's the word that's in, not the word but, but transgressions against you for sure yeah, because I was done wrong, but I also accepted it and I also like agreed to it and it also still felt gross. But like you said, that program didn't go forward because you know that you're teaching others how you're going to be treated in some ways. So you weren't going to say we can do it for 10 and then later have to say, but we're only going to do it for 10 until 100 patients you know, yeah. 15 patients go through and then we're going to do it for 26 and then we're going to do it for 36 and then we're going to do it for 56. That's just, that's just not realistic. Like people aren't going to respond well to that and you're probably never going to see that money. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that was part of my like argument of not wanting to do this was like, I am saying it's okay to present for this crazy <laughs> like I'm, I'm okay to say I pay to play and I was not okay with that and I did not want to be that person but we decided that it was beneficial in certain ways and mm -hmm. we were excited about it <clears throat> though I still feel like it was wrong and they shouldn't have programs like that they were exploiting yeah. the presenters I hope they paid panelists that they invited because I went to a panel and I plan to ask because I I want to continue that conversation with this program, but I hope that paid panelists who were, there was a trans man who was talking about giving birth. There was a trans woman who was talking about transitioning and healthcare support. And then there was a physician who runs a Euro office. Like they work with trans health mm -hmm. and she was, I think at a university, they were doing studies and collecting data and she was a physician. I hope they were paid. I hope the money that they were going to pay me went to them because I, I don't want them to be out by teaching me what I learned at that conference. And I, I know nurses think that it's done differently. The fact that you were surprised means that this is a secret. <laughs> this is not well known and it should be well known because I don't think nurses should stand for it. But that would have taken like 25, 30 presenters to say, mm, you can go to hell, right? And so I don't have access to those 30 presenters. They don't let us know who's been accepted ahead of time, maybe so that we can't talk and be like, what'd you get? But in my trauma-informed <laughs> business model, I think that that's okay. It, we should be able to be transparent about that stuff because it should challenge me as the business owner to be ethical and fair isn't the word I want, but fair, ethical and fair. And yeah, sometimes we need to be checked about that. And also that usually promotes excitement if folks are pa paid fairly and they should be excited about what they get paid. And that's what I share with the folks that I pay is I want you to be excited. I don't want you to be doing this and resent it. Just like you would have resented that program in Massachusetts that resentment would have crossed it into your client care totally right just like just like biases do like we don't want them to they do mm -hmm. so yeah that was a downside but I have a new perspective going in I've never had in a conference before and it's so it's it's fucked up I mean it's 
cool to see like these different parts of it. Like I was an attendee to conferences when I was a student. I think I went to like small ones, local ones when I was a nurse. And then the pandemic was like a perspective shift for everyone. And now as a business owner, a trauma-informed business model business owner, as I'm trying to be, I have made changes in my business that have not been modeled to me and done that with a team where we've had to like figure it out and think like, how do we be transparent? How do we be ethical? How do we be fair? And I didn't see a lot of that, but like I went to go talk about trauma-informed care. So I shouldn't have expected to see it. I just saw that there were missing pieces of information, like you said, communication. And there was no welcome committee. There was no meet and greet. There was no communication about where you should check in, who the other speakers were. There was no camaraderie around helping speakers actually meet other speakers. So all your speakers are your change makers in this industry. These are the people who have the goods. These are the people who are talking about these progressive subjects that we want to be on the loudspeaker. Yet this organization being a national organization, having national reach, didn't take the opportunity to intentionally put all their change makers in a room and say, here's your magic dust that we just sprinkled on you go change the world. Instead, right. it almost seems, and who knows if this was, you know, really behind kind of their actions, but it almost seems intentionally they kept you apart. Maybe they didn't want you to talk about who was getting paid what. Maybe they didn't want you to talk about X, Y, and Z. But in my opinion, a better approach would have been to put all of your change makers and your speakers in a room at least a couple times throughout this conference to say, you guys are the go-getters. You guys are the golden child. You guys are the people who have the means and the resources and the willpower and the brains mm -hmm. to do this and to move our industry forward. Mm -hmm. We gave you no agenda. We just wanted you to have three hours to talk amongst yourselves, mm -hmm. to network, to get together, to get to know one another. And that mark was really missed, I think, with this conference. Yeah, for sure. And the magic sprinkle is like food. Just Maybe. feed us. Just, yeah. just like put some food That's there, simple. real simple and a show of respect and a show yeah. of appreciation, which yeah. would be very small. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll give that feedback. Like, I'm happy to give that feedback. I expected it because I've seen it at other conferences, but maybe these conference leaders hadn't been to other conferences outside of nursing. And I think that's an important distinction. So if there are presenters that are listening that want to learn about conference, go to a conference outside of nursing, level up your standards so that we can all level up standards for each other inside of nursing, because we, I'm doing that. And now when I'm asked to present, I ask, what's your anti-racism plan for your company? And what's the required education that everyone has to take? Who's teaching inclusivity and gender expansive language in your company? who's in charge of marketing and who am I going to be talking to about my intellectual property, right? I have to be aware of that as a business owner and an online face and online business. I have to be aware of like, how are you using my intellectual property? Who's going to see the video? Where's it going? How long do you have access? I want someone to read the contracts with me so that I know because you have to have your own back. So I think it's interesting to see it from all perspectives and very, very helpful and also helps me in my business and moving forward with other <clears throat> presenters, business leaders. It was all very, very helpful. I got to see posters of folks that I wish I could meet in person. I was like, where are these people? I want them to be like, I want to talk yeah. to you. So there's some email follow-up that's going to happen. It was cool. It was cool to share space and to share energy with other people. That was really cool and different. We haven't seen it. We were all masked. We didn't get COVID. There was very little COVID spread within the whole conference, which, which I was very impressed with. Okay. And we didn't like eat together, mm. which is probably why. Yeah. <laughs> I would have done, love to have done more of that. Give me COVID. Let me eat with these people. <laughs> no, I don't want COVID. I do want like, yeah, I like the round table places that I could be in where I could speak to others one-on-one. -on -one. So it was cool to be a presenter and nurses would come up and talk to me. Yeah. 
even in the Starbucks line, they would come up and be like, thanks for your presentation. I was there. I was like, Hey, who are you? They're like, Oh, I'm a nurse educator. I live in Iowa. And I really liked your presentation. This is what I'm trying to do. And just like see each other and just be like, Oh, that's badass. Like, that's so great. A nurse came up to me and said, after my presentation on stirrups are restraints, which was really fun. It doesn't sound fun because it's restraints, but it was, <laughs> it was fun. They came up and they said, I want to be an advocate for my patients. <clears throat> I teach them all of these things that you're saying. I teach them all the information I have. What I have is for them. And, you know, she was echoing all of the things that we had just talked about, like teaching them, listening to them, hearing their story, being open to where they're at, learning about their goals and advocating for what they want and really trying to center them in a system that just doesn't do that. And it's not modeled. You don't see that. And I was like, that's great. And she said, well, my frustration is that they still go along with whatever they're told to do. And so I don't tell them what to do. I ask what they want to do. I give them options. I support their answers. And I, you know, am with them for like, let's, I don't know, let's try this new thing. Let's try that. What do you think? And I give them opportunity. And I was like, yes, that's amazing. Do it. And she said, well, when a provider comes in, they get told and they say, this is my recommendation. We need to do this. Whether it's manipulative or not, or like super direct, they just come in and they're like, this is what we're doing. And she said, the patients do it. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, you don't have to do it. I'm here. Like all this work and all this time and all this education and all this like patient centering that the nurse has done, she was like, it gets washed away. They just do what they're told. And she was upset about it. <clears throat> and she said, what do we do? And this was in my role play. Like we had a patient in my role play who finally just turned over and put her legs in stirrups. And I was like, yeah, I know that that happens. It happens all the time. And I tried to just open her perspective to, you know, one of the hardest parts about being a nurse is that we don't get to see the outcome of our work. We don't get to see what they go do at home. We don't get to see that they educate their whole family on what we taught them. We don't get to see what difference we made in their lives. We don't get to see what happens later. We don't get to see the end. And I said, what if you're the first person to ever give them so many choices, they really felt in charge the whole time you're taking care of them, which could be 12 hours. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, that sucks. That's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. And I was like, yeah, but not the first one. We want this to be normal. We want this, we, teaching our children to expect this, right? To level up their expectations and what respect looks like. And she's like, of course. And I said, would you expect your child to then implement everything you just taught them in one day in one of the most difficult tests they've ever encountered? And she was like, oh, well, then no, I mean, that's really hard. And I said, it could be the first time that that patient feels it from you, learns it from you, gets modeled it because you get so many interactions with your patients. You get to be like, what do you think? I'm listening to you. Let's do what you think. How's your body feel? Let's respond to that. You get so many opportunities for that. So it's a lot of learning in a little bit of time over the lifespan but then when someone in power, I was like, they're wearing a coat. They're the doctor. We've all been told to do what the doctor says. The family's saying, do what your doctor says. The doctor's saying, do what your doctor says. <laughs> There's only so much that we can do in the middle of that. I said, your, their choice is not your responsibility. But what if they make that choice? They decide to go with what the doctor does because that's what everyone's saying. That's what everyone's saying. But inside, it's the first time that it feels really wrong. And she's like, <laughs> Yeah. I hope so, but I don't hope so. Right. And that is when things change in their life. And that beyond is when they say, I'm not going to let someone talk to me like that, or I'm going to listen to my gut because my gut told me that that was a weird decision. And then I did it. And then it responded. That was a bad decision. What if you listened earlier to yourself and they move forward teaching their kids how to listen to their gut and how to listen to what their body is saying and how to ask questions and push back to authority or perceived authority in those situations. And she's like, okay, that's totally good enough for me. It's a lot to think about 
overhauling such a dysfunctional system. Right? It's a socialization too. Yeah, it's not a healthcare system issue. It's socialization that everyone has told them that the doctor is always right. And the doctor kind of takes that position of power and feels a responsibility to give answers and to give, these are my professional opinions. And, you know, you have these two choices that they can see that are kind of subjective. They're based on a lot of education and experience, but they're also kind of subjective. You're going to get different answers with different physicians. Right. And not every physician is like that. And not every provider is like that, but it is so common that that is the that is the barrier that I get after presentations like this is like, they still choose what they're told to do. I'm like, of course they do. They've done that for 25 years. Like we did that until we stopped doing that. We still do that when we break or when we're vulnerable or when we enter a new situation and you don't know how to advocate for yourself. We're okay. thinking about our baby. We're told these totally. things kind of are manipulative or coercive. So it was a cool conversation and one that I really valued having in person. That was really cool. It was really cool. So I will be doing more <laughs> conferences. I really like it. And <laughs> the nurse conference loop is needs work just like nurses, nurse culture needs work just like healthcare system needs work. So yeah, I like that. I appreciate that you tied those together in a way that's super understandable and makes me feel less like I really got taken. I really feel like I came out with a lot, but we did put a lot into it, money, time, resources, all that. And it just goes to show how trauma-informed foundational care, trauma-informed lifestyle (laughs) education really is a powerful, like, compass for how to be treated and how to treat others and how to just think about who are we prioritizing? Who are we centering and listening to what could possibly be viewed by our actions instead of like our intent's good. We, you know, everyone should be so thankful to be here. It just, it's, it's everywhere. It's mirrored in everything. And I see it everywhere. Even, even at that big fat conference that, Yeah. yeah, we went to as a, And that new perspective was super cool. So I'd love to hear if others are thinking about taking their topic and going out to conferences and starting to apply or even local conferences, there's a bunch and, you know, getting your feet wet in that new territory. I would love to talk about that on this podcast. So find our little form on pulsecheck.podcast on Instagram fill it out and we'll have you to talk about it. Have some coffee with you on our show. Thanks for this cool little Q and a he he. Yeah, this was awesome. And look, playing devil's advocate. I think there's a space of transition where, you know, it happens in every industry. You've got to teach the world and the industry and the leaders of that industry. What is now expected of them as our world grows and continues and as kind of roles change. So nurses are leaving bedside. They aren't going to be able to speak at conferences for free because this is now their income. And I think there is this gray area where people like you and I maybe do have to take a conference or two or a hand for free or low fee or for maybe like trades of goods and services type things until we can teach the industry what is the new norm and what now is expected of them to ensure that everybody has, you know, quality of life due to fair compensation and that people are really being compensated for their expertise because as much as the leaders of this national conference probably think that they could all get online on stage and teach, I think it's very apparent that they need nurses from around the country and around the world to truly put this event on. And hopefully in the years to come, the people who are speaking will be compensated for their time and expertise. Yeah, for sure. Equitable compensation, okay. right? That's the word I was trying to think of that whole time. Equitable. That really feels good, hee hee. And you're right. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, this was fun. Oh my goodness. As always, you guys, if you have a story that you'd like to share with us, if you are a woman or gender expansive person in medicine, we would love to hear your story. Come on here and tell us about what it's like working within the halls of an American hospital. Until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.
If you or anyone you know has a story to share, please contact us on Instagram at pulsecheck.podcast. We'd love to share your story.